And uh, so this morning, uh, we are so glad to have uh, Doug Manning. He's going to come in his own way and, and share with us. I asked him to, um, uh, to, to give us some insight, some, some tips on conversation. Uh, how do we create conversation? And also uh, being a part of the um, um, meeting on yesterday, Commission on Ministry, we talked about um, self-care. And I think that this is a part of that self-care uh, that we can receive, not just give to others, but also we can receive for our ministries as well. So uh, again, welcome. I'm going to turn it over to, to Doug. Uh, and uh, Doug, again, thank you so much for agreeing and con cons consenting to come and share with us this morning. Thank you. Bill Shields is going to kind of start. Okay, Bill. Thank you, Pastor Rogers. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Can you hear me okay? Too yes. loud. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, many of the people in the church that I served uh, were best friends and kept up with each other and helped each other. I retired from First Christian Purcell in June of 2015 after 12 years as their pastor. We, we need to encourage that friendship and support of the members. The, the, the problem I had in dealing with people who are grieving is that I see it as their problem that I need to solve for them. And if I downplay the grief or say it's going to be okay, be tough, comes off as saying to them that their grief isn't important and it isn't significant. And uh, I had a lot of trouble waiting for them to ask for help. I often offered advice, free advice, uh, that they weren't ready to hear. And, and uh, discerning God's will especially for somebody else, is very, very difficult. I found in Doug's book, Don't Take My Grief Away, and the, and the video, Journey of Grief, uh, helps understand the importance of listening to grieving people and em empathize with their pain. I played the 65-minute video in four 20-minute sessions for the men at the alcohol and drug rehab ranch where I worked as a chaplain. Alcoholics have lost uh, many close relationships and important things and are full of grief. This year, everybody has lost meaningful contacts with family and friends because of the COVID-19 virus. And many loved ones have died during this pandemic. And Doug and I were talking about the rising level of grief in our community and wondering if there's anything that we could do that would be helpful. Uh, that's, that's why I called Pastor Rogers and uh, tried to make contact with pastors that uh, might be open to uh, helping their parishioners to be good friends and, and uh, help their friends through grief. So that's why Doug's here. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill. Bill is a longtime friend of mine. Uh, we've been together a long time. We could tell great stories on him. If you ever want to know anything, I'll be happy to share it with you. Since you're a bunch of ministers, I should always, I think I should tell you, first of all, who I am so that you'll know uh, whether to to say to, to to listen to me or not, I I, I, I tilted Southern Baptist uh, windmills for thirty years. I was pastor at uh, First Baptist Church, Weatherford, uh, Southern Hills Baptist Church, Tulsa, and then God sent me to to, to Texas to suffer for my sins at, at Hereford, Texas, and I and I retired. I I, I changed occupations in nineteen when I was in nineteen eighty two, when I was fifty years old. I became full-time author and a public speaker at that time. And I, uh, and then after that, a group of us started a, kind of an experimental kind of a church, and I, and I pastored it. I was the unpaid worship, worship leader for, seven, for several years, for seven years, I think, for that until I moved from Texas back to Oklahoma City where all of my kids live. And uh, I'm a member of the uh, of a congregational church, May Mayflower Congregational Church, was a very liberal church, so you need to know that. But I consider myself to be a Quaker, so I'm just kind of a, such a Duke's mixture. I don't even make anything out of me you want to make out of me. That, that, that's who I am. And I'm not an expert on grief. There aren't any experts on grief. Basically, grief is as unique as a fingerprint. 
I, I'm just a person that's listened to an awful lot of stories. I've spent my life listening to stories. People have educated me. And, and I just come around to repeat the stories. Matter of fact, I, I, if you've got any stories, I'd like to have them. I, I steal stories because all originality and no plagiarism made many a dull speech. And so I'm constantly looking for stories to tell and, and share. And that's kind of what I am, a storyteller. And I'd like to tell you some stories today. You know, we, we talked a great deal, Bill and I, about how could we help? How could we help? How could we help? And we thought all kinds of things. You know, I do grief groups, by the way, on Zoom. If you've got some people that are really in struggle that you'd recommend them, I, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, I do some on, online individuals, if you, you know, if you've got some that's really hurting. But we talked about all that. But, you know, the most of help is going to have to come from the friends. And unfortunately, most of the hurt comes from their friends, friends saying the wrong things or friends being afraid to say anything and turning the people into, the, I've had, I don't, I don't know how many of them have said, when did I become invisible? You know, nobody wants to talk to me. Everybody avoids me. And so I decided that the best thing we could possibly do if we really want to make an impact in grief right now would be to train, train your people how to be friends how to talk to people about grief. And the best people to do that are, are the pastors. They'll listen to you. Uh, you have that role. You're that important. And so I decided maybe I could just tell you how I see grief. And maybe you could get some things out of that that you could then use. And I used to call it developing a priest at every elbow, you know, training each other so that we can help each other and share each other's burden. I kind of stumbled into grief. Uh, I was pastoring in Tulsa at the time, and, and I had a young couple, had a little girl, 18-month-old little girl named Kristen, who had the croup. And she got worse during the day, and, and they, so they took her to the doctor, and he put her in the hospital, put her under oxygen, and that's really all that was called for. This isn't a medical mistake. It was just one of those inexplicable things that happened. He sent the husband home to take care of the other child in the home. And in 30 minutes, Kristen died. And of course, the wife was hysterical, crying out of control. The, and, and the doctor was trying to calm her down because he wasn't comfortable with that. And when the husband got back, he was doing the same thing. And, he, and she stopped and looked at them and said, don't take my grief away from me. I deserve it. And I'm going to have it. And I always felt like that's one of the more profound statements I'd ever heard under pressure. But I also was glad I wasn't there because had I been there, that's exactly what I would have been doing. I saw, I saw my job. My job was to cheer people up. My job was to keep them from crying. I didn't see, I, I saw tears almost as toxic. Tears are memories in motion. Best thing you can do in grief is grieve. And the best way to grieve is cry, you know, but I would do anything. I, you know, I'd throw scriptures at them. Till I, I'm sure some people still like to quote, cram the King James version down my neck <laughs> right now, you know, or I'd tell jokes at inappropriate times. I'd do anything in the world. I thought if I got them through the funeral and they didn't cry, I'd done a great job. And that statement woke me up and I said, you know, I don't know anything about grief. So I started reading. I read every book I could find. And at that time, that was three books. Nobody wrote about grief back in those days. There were the, the three I read, only one of them was really about grief. One of them was Great Grief, which has been out forever and ever and ever. Then I, there was the, the, the second book was, was a, a book about a, a, past, a, a, a famous pastor that died and his wife was writing it. And it was more about the pastor's life story than it was grief. And another was called Widow. And it was a lady who started a national organization to help widows. There wasn't much in there about grief. And so I got a group of people together that had just suffered the death, the death of, a, of a loved one. And I started, I guess, some of the first grief groups. I didn't know what that was. I, I didn't know anything about groups. Back in those days, nobody knew anything about groups, but I just got them together and, and listened to them. And I've been doing that ever since, just listening to stories. That's the best way in the world, I think, to figure it out, how people, what people are experiencing in the grief process. Now, when I'm talking about grief to a group, I get someone up in, the, in front of the audience and I hand them a bucket. And I say to them, okay, the, the bucket represents your feelings. 
you let's say you just lost somebody, somebody's dear to you. Let's tell me what, what would feelings would be there. And of course they say such things as pain and sorrow or grief or fear. And then I get the audience involved in it also. And they, they begin to tell all the different feelings, guilt, uh, uh, sometimes relief, and then you feel guilty because you felt relief, uh, anger, all of the feelings, just feelings pour out of the audience. And then I say, okay, what kind of thoughts would be going through your mind? And such things as where was God or why did he allow this to do? Or, or, you know, just thoughts, every kind of thing. Where am I going? How will I go? Who will take care of me? How will I live? All of those kind of thoughts are going through their mind. And, and then I say, okay, what kind of frustrations are there? And then, then they begin to get into frustrations. You know, my sister took over and, <laughs> and planned the whole funeral. I didn't say anything. All kinds of frustrations. And then I stop and say, you realize what we're picturing is here, the bucket is full. It's overwhelmed. It's overflowing. When people are in grief, their their emotions are overflowed. Their mind is overflowing. Everything about them is overflowing. I said, well, the problem is I have a bucket also. And my bucket's full of platitudes and scriptures. And see, I want you to feel better. And so I want to come along and pour what's in my bucket into your bucket but there's no room in your bucket. It's already overflowing. So it just washes off like water off a duck's back. But, but see, the other problem is I'm scared to death of your bucket. I don't want to get in there with you. You might get cry out of control and I wouldn't know how to do it. Or I might say the wrong thing or, or there's a lot of intimacy when you're talking to people about their pain and their grief. And I'm kind of scared of intimacy. I'd rather kind of be at arm's length. So I just kind of want to come around and pour my bucket into your bucket. I, I spoke to a Compassionate Friends conference. Uh, that's people who've lost children. And they asked me to talk about guilt and anger in grief. And so I just asked the audience, what do you, what do you feel guilty about? And, and several people talked, but one lady, I never could get her. I can't still, I can still see her. She said all the way to the hospital, my little boy asked me, begged me to turn around and go back. He didn't want the transplant. He was afraid. And I would turn around and he died. Well, after we talked around, I went back to that lady and I said, how many times has someone said to you, you were acted out of love? She said, oh, many times. And I said, did that help? No. How many times does somebody say, well, he would have died anyway if he hadn't had the shot, if he hadn't had the transplant? Oh, she said, yeah, I've heard that. Did it help? No. How many times have they said, uh, now it's been four years. Oh, she said, yeah, that hurts. So how many times they said, God won't put any, and she wouldn't even let me complete that sentence. She said, that one really makes me mad. And I said, okay. Would it help if I just came over there and hugged you and said, that must really hurt? Would that help? She said, yeah, that would help. Now, why would that help? That would help because I'm getting in her bucket. I mean, I'm, I'm legitimizing her pain. I'm saying, I know you hurt and I'm, I'm comfortable with that hurt. I'm not going to run from that hurt. I'm going to visit with you. I'm going to walk with you. I, what I do, I don't call what I do companion, counseling. I call it companioning. I'm going to get in your bucket. And we're going to walk together in your pain. Now, I learned two things that, that, that day that were very profound to me. Number one, I found out that healing always begins in the other person's bucket. It never begins in our bucket. I don't have anything I can say that's going to take their grief away from them. Not a thing. No magic words, no magic pill, nothing. It begins in their bucket. And my role is not to put stuff in their bucket. My role is to help them empty their bucket. And so that, that it always begins in the other person's bucket. 
The second thing I learned is that must really hurt is probably one of the most comforting things you can say to somebody that's in pain. And that sounds so strange because we think we ought to cheer them up. We ought to say something positive, but that must really hurt means I'm acknowledging your pain. I'm talking about, I'm, t I'm dealing with it. It's kind of a funny story there, if you don't mind me telling it. I, we did this conference. I did a conference up in New York State, and, and there were a bunch of funeral directors. And one of the, I did the, my, did my bucket thing, and he didn't see it. One young man didn't see it. I mean, he didn't get it. That afternoon, he raised his hand and said, okay, okay. He said, somebody just walks in my funeral home just had a death. What do I say to them? And I said, well, the, the, you, there's a, way, a lot of ways to say it, but basically you say that must really hurt. First, you acknowledge the pain. Oh, well, the next morning he caught me and he said, you know, that stuff works. And I said, really? Why? Well, he said, after the meeting last night, there was a, there was a bar in the, in the resort where we were. I said, I went in the bar, said a girl was singing and there's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life and said the most beautiful voice. They said, I was just overwhelmed. And so he said, I asked her if I could buy her a drink. And so she said, yes. And so at the break, I bought her a drink and said, we were having this very perfunctory conversation, not going anywhere. And finally she said, I just broke up with my boyfriend. And he said, I said, that must really hurt. And he said, man, it got warm in there. And we, we've exchanged it, uh, te telephone numbers. We're going to start dating. I said, I wasn't trying to give you a pickup line to use in bars. <laughs> but but he, he emailed me a year later and said, it's still working. The concept, of it, the concept fits just outside of grief. You First, you acknowledge the pain. First, you stop there, right there. And the reason that works is this. I discovered a word. My, my, my daughter says I only know three words, and I've written 30, 35 books about them, and I, I, she's probably right, but I wish she wouldn't say it. But, but if I only know three words, one of my major words is significance. What I mean by that is when things happen to us, the first thing we want to do and the first thing we need to do is establish the significance of that event. It's like a little boy falls down out in the street, hurts his hand, hurts himself, comes in, hurts his hand. Nothing there, but he wants a Band-Aid on it, right? And he puts a Band-Aid on it, and then he goes around and shows everybody, see my boo-boo, see my boo-boo? You know, what, what's he doing? He's establishing the significance of that event. After everyone has seen the boo-boo, you take the bandage off, throw it away, everything's fine. But let me tell you, when he's trying to show it to you, if you don't look at it, he'll kick you in the shins. That's human nature. We want people to know what happens to us. You know, you, 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 have you ever had surgery? It's the first thing you want to do. You want to show them the scar if you can. If you don't do that, then you're going to bore them to death telling the story. I didn't just have surgery. I had the worst surgery that ever was. My gallbladder weighed 36 pounds. It took a doctor and two nurses to lift it. And it's a miracle I'm alive. I think doctors just run them down the hospitals telling everybody there, you know, it's a miracle you're alive. <laughs> you know, because they all come out of there. It's a miracle I'm alive. I asked a doctor recently, have you ever said that? He said, I've never said it. I said, well, you've been quoted as saying it. Matter of fact, he, he broke down and told me a story. He said, when he was a young doctor, the, an old doctor said, if you really want your patients to love them, love you, hold their hand and look at them and say, that's the worst case of that I've ever seen. <laughs> and he said, he said, I saw it happen. He held this little lady's hand and said, Mary, that's the worst case I've ever seen. And she just beamed <laughs> because why she could go out and establish significance. That's it. Now in grief, in grief, there are three levels of significance. The first level is need to establish the significance of their loss. And that sounds a little weird because you'd think when someone died, the, for, the only thing to be on your mind, be the person that died, but it isn't. The first thing that's on your mind is, what's going to happen to me? Can I live? How will I live? Who will take care of me? Do I, can I exist? I, I'm, I'm totally lost. It's right here. Basically, I need somebody to help me understand and, and, and hear my story. Everybody's got a story. Everybody, want, everybody needs to tell their story. You know, there's always a death story. There's always, you know, every time and, and they need to have it heard. It's here. It's being heard. People heal. 
when they're after they're heard, after they're understood. And it's it if if they can be understood, they can move on. If they can't be understood, they park. People that are that that never get past their grief are people that never had it, never could establish the significance of the of what happened to them. You know, I had two ladies in some in a conference somewhere. And the conference wasn't about grief. And, and so just out of the blue, they raised their hand and said, our mother's the most negative person we've ever, you've ever seen. She remembers ever hurts ever happened to her and talks about them all the time. And so we don't know what to, how to deal with her. Well, it wasn't a setting where I could really deal with them all as much as I wanted to in the meeting. And so I caught him in the hotel lobby after it's over with, I said, what does your mother say most often? They said, well, the thing she says all the time to us is, that her, she says her life stopped when her little boy died and said, you know, she still has us and said, our little brother died 61 years ago. And I said, next time she says that, try something. It may not work, but try it. Reach over and touch her and say, mom, how'd that make you feel? Because 61 years ago, nobody ever asked her that question. And she's still trying to get attention, still trying to try, trying to establish the significance of a loss that happened 61 years ago. See, after I discovered, after I discovered grief and talking in this area, I found out that grief is one of the major social problems of our time. Now we, that's kind of a strange thing to say because we don't think it as a social problem but we don't have any idea how many social problems come out of grief or trauma that were never proper dealt with and were sit and when they sit there and festered until they became social problems. You don't know how much divorce comes out of grieving. We can't prove it statistically, but one of the hardest things a family ever has to go through is the death of a child. But the problem is they don't divorce immediately. They divorce way down the road. And so we don't see the connection. So we don't know how much substance abuse comes out of grief, grief that's not properly dealt with. Uh, I've, I've walked with a lady for many years whose 24 year old daughter was murdered. Her daughter had a drinking problem uh, and, and, and an adult problem. And, and she was a very talented and very beautiful daughter. And when the word came out that people couldn't understand how she could do that, that, that family spent over a quarter of a million dollars trying to heal her for her problem, those, send them to those resorts and she'd stay 30, three months, what, $30,000 a month and, and get high on the way home. Never could deal with it until finally she's in the wrong place at the wrong time buying drugs and was murdered. And, 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 and you know, after the fact and talking with the mother, I kind of figured out, I think maybe one of the reasons she never could get over it when that little girl was nine years old, her father was killed in a plane crash. The plane that crashed in Dallas, remembers many years ago, the Delta flight, he was killed. And, and sometime after the funeral, the mother walked in the bedroom where the daughter was, and the daughter was crying, and they got hysterical together, and it was very scary. And when they finally got over it, the, the, daughter, the mother said, what can I do to help you? And the little girl said, if you just wouldn't cry anymore. And they made a pact to never cry. Now, when a nine-year-old starts trying to control her emotions and her feelings, and to that degree, you have a problem. And as she grew, she, she, she developed heat, eating disorders first because that's control. They want to control even what happens to their body. She, everything was control, 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 and dealing with the pain, she had to escape it. And I think that left. But everywhere she went, nobody ever, none of the, none of the, places where she went ever talked to her about the grieving. They talked to her. They thought she was codependent with her mother because that was kind of the hot issue at the time. And nobody ever dealt with that unresolved grief. You know, I, I, I don't like to watch those hoarder programs. My daughter watches them, but I can't watch them. I'm, I'm too much of a neat neck. You know, I say just burn the house down, you know, but, but if you read, if you watch the hoarder programs, nearly every hoarder in every case, they started hoarding after a loss. No, I flipped by there one day and my husband and wife were both hoarders. And he said, after our little boy lost, died, we couldn't even throw away a trash bag. 
we've had all the loss we wanted. So, see, so you, when we're dealing with this and we're and we're trying to deal with people, we're not just dealing with period of sadness. You're dealing with something that can have long-term impact on people's lives, and so allowing them to have to establish the significance of that event, let them talk about it, let them tell the story, let them tell it over and over and over again. They're just looking to be understood. They want to be heard, they want to be understood. The second level of significance is they need to establish the significance of the person they lost. You know, that's when they want to talk about the person. They want to share with the person. They want to talk about it. One of my big pet, one of my big drives in life has been to change the funeral, to make it into a personal thing where you tell the story of the person, where you share with people who this person is and what they are. I, 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 I quite by accident, when my grandmother died, my, my father, the night before the funeral said, let's go down and visit with Mama Hoyle. And so we went down to the cemetery, to the funeral home, and sat with her body and told stories for hours and hours. And, and I, I thought, man, I don't remember anything about the funeral next day, but I really thrilled at that, after that night, just telling stories. And, and I didn't really know the value of that until my father-in-law died. And unfortunately, he had two, son, two daughters, and they both married Baptist preachers. I don't know what sin he was being suffered, punished for. But, but since there were two of us, neither, neither of us want to take over. So I didn't suggest that we have this meeting together where the family could tell stories. And, and I drove home after the funeral. It was sad. There so many things I wanted to say about my father-in-law I didn't get to say so many stories I wanted to hear about him that I knew I would never hear. That's such an impact. The first book I wrote was a, was a book called A Minister Speaks About Funerals, trying to suggest to pastors, get your families together and let them tell stories. And from that time on, every funeral I've ever done, I have a family meeting before it. So let them tell stories. I, it's not a time for me to, just to get material for a funeral. I just... And when they talk, when they forget I'm there, it's a marvelous, marvelous experience. They're not all great, but they're great. But out of that experience, some things happen. First of all, it breaks down the barriers so the family can grieve together. It, the second thing is the stories live. Nobody's dead till they're forgotten, and those stories keep those people alive. My family, every time they got together, would tell Mama Hoyle stories. I not only knew the stories they tell, I knew the I knew the, the order in which they would tell them, you know. But in the process of that my grand my kids know my grandmother who died before most of them were born. And my grandkids know a little bit about her just because of the storytelling that happens within the family. It's see, that's that's establishing that the significance of that person. This is who this person was. This is who this person is. It's the significance of the person. And, and, they, and, the, and the griever needs to talk about it because the truth is they don't know the value of that person. You, you never know what you've lost until you lose it. You really don't know the value of the person you lost. Many years ago, many, many years ago my wife had bypass surgery and and it was under real trying conditions. And, and I, 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 ooh, I didn't know whether she was going to make it or not. And I always say, you know, that long day, I discovered value to her that I didn't know existed. But then I would say, but you know, I still don't know her value and I won't unless she dies first. And I thought I had dibs on that. I was going to die first. <laughs> no, I didn't want to die second. I wanted to die first. <laughs> You know, that's why I don't jog. And, you know, you think I'm going to take care of myself so I can go live in a nursing home and <laughs> you're nuts, man. I want to die first, but I didn't get to. Barbara died 10 years ago. But you see, until she's gone, the, you don't know. It's kind of like you have to inventory the loss before you can grieve. And that inventory, every day you think of something else you want to say to them. Every day you think of something else you want to do with them. Every day you want to think some question you should ask them. Every day, it's just constant, constant reviewing, reviewing, 
it, it's it's a matter of fact i kind of break grief down into two segments first there is a period of mourning that happens you, you could say maybe the first year it it, it it happens when it happens very times but basically it, it, it's 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 a period of mourning the first year and the first year is tough that's when they're hurting the most. That's when the grief comes. Grief comes in waves that just overwhelm them. That's when they're hurting and pain. And it's also when they get all the interruptions in the world. They have to take care of business. They have to pay bills. They have to do insurance. They have to do all this stuff. And that's when other inter and then that's when all the in first anniversary first anniversaries are anniversary of death, anniversary of birth, anniversary of marriage. And that's when the first the first Christmas is, and the first Thanksgiving, and the first Easter. So that whole year is just chaotic. And, and, but as that period of mourning passes, people think the grieving is over. It isn't. Grief is a journey. The journey starts. And that journey is, is that long period of, 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 of inventorying, you know, covering. I often say that my third anniversary was worse than my second, not because I was crying, but because it was more real and because it was very evident to me that it was never going to change and the inventory was more complete. So it takes a long time for that inventory to, to, to pass. And, that, and that's, that's, that's why they need to talk about the person. Every time somebody can listen, they need to talk about the person. When I'm dealing with people individually in, in, in grieving, you know, I set aside a time when I just say, tell me about John. Tell me about this. Don't be afraid to mention their name. They want to hear it. They don't want them forgotten. They want to know about them. They want to know that people care. And the third level of, of significance is a social significance. They need their friends to know, too. That's why we have funerals. So we can get together and, and we can tell family how much this person meant to them. You know, that's why I want flowers at funerals. You know, then nowadays everybody's just giving gifts to charity. I'll give charity some other way. I want flowers there. When my, when my wife died, there were 78 different flower arrangements brought to the funeral home. Every one of them meant so much to me that this lady, these people loved my wife. She was that that important to them, she mattered to them. If you, if you really want to help people, you know, remember, remember their loved one long term. The guy that that booked me to go to, to tour Australia was a guy named Paul Castaldi, and, and he was one of the wonderful guys of my life. I, I love Paul, but he was also one of the most fastidious people I've ever met. He would figure out how to get out of every restroom we ever went in without touching the doorknob, whatever that meant. I saw him touch, grab the top of the door with his fingernails. I, I, I would have broken every fingernail I had trying to get out. And I teased him all the time I was there about it, trying to get out of the restrooms. Now, I, 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 a couple of years after I was there, Paul Costello was killed in a car, wreck, car accident. Of course, I wrote his wife, Judy, at that time. And then... This, I wrote, it, wrote her the first year. Just for the second year, I wrote her a letter and said, Judy, I think of Paul every time I go in the restroom. I try to remember how, hey, I figure out how he would get out of this one. And I said, those restrooms in, in airports now that don't have a door, I've never walked in one of them yet that I didn't say, now Paul would love this one. You know, and I'm not lying to her, I really did. And, and, so, and you know, those things that spit out the, the towels, now, I, I think he invented those after he got to heaven to send them back. Now, that seems like a weird thing to write to a widow on the second anniversary of his death. But to her son, Pablo, had to come to the States for a convention where I was speaking. And he grabbed me and hugged me till I thought I was going to break. And he said, I can't tell you what that letter meant to mother. Because it meant somebody still remembers him. He still has significance in somebody's life he's important to somebody he has significance it's establishing significance and the journey continues i uh, toward the ultimate goal i i i uh, 
my my wife used to love to watch the uh, the uh, uh, all the horse the four horse races. It's kind of strange. She never went to a horse race in her life, and she never bet a nickel nickel on anything in her life. But she she loved those four horse races, the, the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont Stakes. And I would watch it with her, and 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 it was just a, a tradition we did every 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 year. Well. A few years ago, fourth or fifth year after her death, I was I was watching the last of the races, the Belmont Stake, and that year we had one horse win all three, the Triple Crown. And I was sitting there watching that, and I got to thinking, boy, Barbara would really like this, wouldn't she? And she really would like this. And that led me to thinking about all of the uh, some uh, all uh, some mar I had a wonderful afternoon of memories. I remembered all the trips because we became a training company. Barbara and I used to drive to all the trainings. We drove to every state in the union. We didn't drive to Alaska. We went there. We didn't drive there or, or Hawaii. We drove to all the state, every state in the union and every province of Canada except Newfoundland by car. So we spent hours and hours and hours in car in the car. We could drive from here to Vancouver, BC, and never turn on the radio. We just talked and visited. You know, of course, you know, we were at an age where we could say the same thing every day and nobody would remember what we remember. So it worked out real well. But we just talked. And I remember I got to living in all those memories, and that brought other memories and other memories. And I was sitting there in just in this wonderful time of memory and so grateful that just full of gratitude you know great gratitude is the is ties the knot in the end of the in the end of your rope it really does and in and in grief ultimately gratitude is is the is the ultimate savior because as i sat there i realized that the things i was enjoying so much remembering were the things that hurt the most when she died the pain, the things that created the most pain when she died became the things I enjoyed remembering the most. And it became clear to me that, that, that ultimately, the ultimate goal is gratitude. Now, you can't do that quickly. You know, one of my, my friend whose daughter was murdered when she heard, or she heard me, re when she read, I wrote that and she read it. She said, yeah, but it's easy for you. You had your wife for 57 years. Said, I only had my daughter for 20, 24. And I said to her, yes, that's true. And it is harder, much harder. But let me tell you, my phone is ringing. I'm sorry. Let me tell you, if you don't ever get comfort, if you don't ever get grateful for the 24, you'll always be a victim of the loss. You either have to become grateful for what you had, or you're always a victim for what you lost. And so the ultimate goal is, is to work toward the time when gratitude can, can come in and tie a knot in, your, in the end of your rope. And now, since you're pastors, can I tell you one other story? When I was, I, I became pastor at Weatherford, Oklahoma, First Baptist Church when I was 24 years old. That can only happen in Baptist world where you don't have to know anything, I guess, because I had not been to seminary. I would, I graduated from college in Weatherford, Oklahoma in May, and they became pastor of First Baptist Church that, that fall in August of that year, became pastor of my college professors, didn't know anything. Every night, every Sunday night, I'd go home and say, I told them everything I know. I don't know what in the world I'm going to do next week. You know, it was agony. It, but I don't know what I don't know what happened. I don't know why that happened. But after I'd been there a couple of years, I got a call one morning. It had been a Sid's death, and I'd never heard that term. I didn't know babies died in the crib. I didn't know anything, you know. That this is pastor. There's been a Sid's death. You have to come. So I get in the car and I'm driving over there, thinking, "What in the world am I going to say when I get there? What am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? I don't know." And when I got there, I walked into utter chaos. The women in the area had gathered, as women do, because they want to help. And they pulled that, they had, they were holding that lady on one side of the room. She was fighting them. They were holding her to keep her from touching the body of her little boy that was lying over on the couch. 
And when I got there, they said, oh, Pastor, you got to help us. She shouldn't, she shouldn't be doing that. She shouldn't be holding him. She shouldn't be doing that. She, she should, she's got to give him up. Well, I didn't know whether she should or not. You know, so I just, I, I can't turn my phone off. I'm sorry. I didn't know whether she should or not. But I took about one step toward them. And somebody said, Mr. Lockstone's here. Mr. Lockstone was the funeral director in our town. Very loved first person. If I could bottle the feeling that swept the room at that moment and sell it, I'd die rich. Because what's the feeling that swept the room was, oh, thank God, Mr. Lockstone's here. He'll know what to do. He'll take care of us. And he walked in and didn't say a word. You always wonder what he's supposed to say. He didn't say a word. He just kind of looked at the women and did something like that. And, and, and they decided they should go to the kitchen. I don't know how he did that. I tell everybody I've tried. I've practiced that, but I don't have it. Uh, you know. But And he looked at me and I thought I was supposed to stay. I hope I was because I did. He still had to say a word. He led that little woman over the couch. He set her down. He picked up the body of her little boy. He laid it in her arms and he sat down beside her. And he said the only words he said all morning. He said, now you hold your little boy as long as you want to. And when you're finished, I'll take care of things. And I stood there in what a friend of mine used to call slack jawed amazement. I was witnessing the power of presence the power of just being there. And I thought, you know, we're going to be here while he, she was fighting that one, those people to get to touch her, but she's not going to give him up after just a few moments. She turned and handed the body to Mr. Longstone and said, take care of my baby. And he just nodded and took her. You see, we pastors don't realize it. that's what we carry around with us. It's called the power of presence. When you walk in, it means something. When you're there, it means something. You carry that power with you because you're, because you're their pastor. And nobody can replace that. Nobody has it to the degree that you have it, you know? It's 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 the power of presence. Did ever did you ever notice that God never did answer a single one of Job's questions? Not a one. He just overwhelmed him with his presence. And Job went from wishing he'd never been born to saying, I know my Redeemer liveth because of presence. I put it all down to this. People in grief need the three H's. They need us to hang around. They need us to hug them and they need us to hush. And so I'm gonna hush and you can ask any questions you'd like to ask or argue any way you'd like to argue, okay? Yeah. And there was dead silence. <laughs> I, I think that we are taking everything that you just said in. Um, you know, one of the questions that I have uh, for you, Doug, is um how do how do pastors how do pastors grieve in the time when they should be helping their parishioners to find some type of healing it's it's extremely difficult because we 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 hold you know people hold us in in a position and we hold ourselves in such a position that we can't really show that we're human and and that's why you burn out, by the way. <laughs> and that's why you don't know how to, we don't know how to take care of ourselves. You see, people basically, I, I forgot to put it in to, to talk about it today. People, people, you, we have to get, we have to give ourselves permission to grieve. And, 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 and that's hard to do because, you know, we don't, we, we don't know. First of all, nobody knows exactly how we're supposed to grieve. And so we, you know, uh, how much am I supposed to cry? I don't know. You know, it's kind of a thing because it's, there's no way to define it per per perfectly, but permission to grieve means we need to find, we, we all have to have safe people 
and safe places where we can grieve, where we can actually share, where we can express ourselves and our feelings with, without, without fear. Uh, I tell you a story, and I, 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 hope it, I hope you understand it. I told a bunch of pastors uh, that I was meeting with, I said, you, you guys need to learn how to cuss. And they, they were they offended, of course, but I said, no, let me tell you, I, I'm using, I use two words. Cursing is using God's name in vain in sexual stuff and, and racial stuff. That's one word. I use, cur, that's, I use cussing. Cussing is expressing your feelings in the strongest language that you're comfortable with, you know, but you need to know how to express your feelings in anger and get it out. You know, some words are stronger than others. And if you're comfortable using them, use those. And, and in the question and answer period, one pastor said something. I don't want it kicked off. And I said, you, you, I think you're way behind in your cussing. He said, oh man, I really am. And I said, well, I live on a lake. I lived on a lake up here at that time. I said, I live on a lake. Come up my place. I'll, we'll sit on my dock and you can cuss all afternoon. He was there the next Monday. And he's been coming ever since, by the way. And he sat on the dock and he said, I'm going to tell you something I can't tell anybody else in the world. As one said, he said, I have a son that's gay. And his theology meant his son was going to hell. And I don't know how to talk about it. You know, pastors have to have some place like that. Some place where you can say, well, you know, in spite of all the facade I put on and all the holy I act. I'm a human being and I have, I have problems too. And I need to talk. I need to talk. And I would invite you all to utilize my ears anytime you want to because <laughs> you're welcome. But basically you just need a place to do it. I don't know. And, and pastors don't get that. Do they? Yeah. I'm glad that you have a, conference coming up on taking care of pastors. That's very, very important. Very important. Anybody hey, what? Yeah, this is Tim Clausing. Um, during this COVID time, people are dying alone. That's right. And uh, we are uh, frustrated, at least I am, at not being there. Yes. Uh, because it's not safe. Yes. What do you think is going to be our course once we become somewhat more normal how do we go back and try to regain that well you know it's never too late to grieve uh it really isn't and so uh you know you you when you go back with them you 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 begin to talk about the person and let them tell their story and, and just like you would do if you would if it's fresh it is it's, they, they it's never too late do you uh, think we need to be proactive with that yeah i think so yes because, you know, first of all, uh, not being there is a very painful thing in addition to the death. And, and, and not being able to be with the person and wondering how they felt and what they said and not having that death story, that, that's very, very powerful, very powerful. And so, yes, I think you need to, we need to sit with them, talk with them. Uh, 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 you know, I, I'm dealing right now with, with some people that are grieving deaths that happened many years ago. You know, and we we just deal with it almost like it's fresh. You know, we just talk about it, deal Thank with you. it, get it out, talk about the person. Yeah, but that's a very good question because that's something we're all facing, and it that's making this whole thing a whole lot worse. Any other questions, Doug? Also, would you share with us? You, Doug has uh, a collection of books that for the first year um, uh, after the loss okay. of the loved one. So Doug, yeah. please, please share I, that. I, I, I will, I, I'm, I'm not good on, I, I'm not, I don't like to go around and peddle books, but, but uh, what happened, I discovered that people in grief can't concentrate. Basically when grief hits, a wave of grief hits, your body secretes cortisol, which makes your mind whirl like a gerbil in a cage and also makes it very difficult to concentrate. It also dehydrates you, by the way, and also makes you very tired. All of that is a process of, of grieving. And so it dawned on me that, that, that 
people won't read. You hand them a thick book, and they won't. They 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 can't read it. They they won't even open it. It's just overwhelms them. And so I, I I tried to write a book that walked people through the first year of grief. And instead of public putting together in one book, I put it together in four. I made it. I divided it up into four books, and we made it into a process, a program that we, we actually have two different sets of that, but, but what the idea is that you send the first book uh, the, the third week after the funeral. The second book comes the third month after the funeral. The next book comes the sixth month after the funeral. And then the last one comes the 11th month after the funeral. And then, and then I have a book addition to that for, for the second year of grief. And so basically what, what the people that you, uh, we sell that to a lot of hospices and, and a lot of other, even individuals and, and, and some churches who just have, you know, they send, they send it from the church itself. And, 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 and I would suggest if you do that, you, you include a letter from the pastor uh, each, each time. Right. Matter of fact, we do a mailing service. We have a set of those that we sell to funeral homes. They use it as an aftercare program uh, all over the United States, Canada, and Alaska, Alaska, I mean, Australia, New Zealand. And, and in the States, we do mailing for a lot of funeral homes. They, 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 they don't want to keep up with it, so we do it for them. And I sign every letter personally, you know, because I, I try to make it as personal as possible. But that little series of books has proven to be a tremendously healing thing. And it's healing not because of the words, it's healing because they're, they are remembered. And, and the, probably the most powerful book is the 11th month when they, I, it's been nearly a year and somebody still remembers my loved one's still important. And, so, and, and my church still is, is thinking about me. You contrast that with the fact that at a compassionate friends meeting, I, a lady walked up to me and said her daughter was, was in a van going to Falls Creek uh, several years ago and they had a wreck and killed her daughter and two, I think another child or so. And she said, my pastor hadn't said a word to me since the funeral. That's tragic. It really is. But, you know, we get busy and we don't know. So we need some way to contact people. And that's the purpose of that series of books. Yeah. Uh -huh. Again, you can go on Insights. I'll put it in the chat, insightsbooks.com. Books.com, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, 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 have, we have a little publishing company. We self-publish the sub-market. And we, we have an office, actually, here in town, here in town, you know, where... Uh, Charleston's is on on uh, on uh, Northwest Expressway. Yes. The white building next door. We're in that building. That it kind of sits back. Yeah, we're in that. 5900 5, Northwest Expressway, Suite yeah. One T. I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll go by and see them. We don't have anybody. We only have one person there now. They were all they're all working at home because of the virus. So it's we're kind of walk, walking a little 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 crazy, but it's all right. We'll manage it. Yeah. 